We're now ready to get to our first main application, and that's the bins and balls problem. So suppose we throw m distinguishable balls into n distinguishable bins randomly. Then we want to know the answers to a few questions. The first question you can see here is what is the probability that bin i has k balls? And then we're going to ask some subsequent questions down below. So let's just get a feel for what, what we've got here. So for example, you know, just to get a visual for what's going on, we've got, let's say, m equals 5. So that's 5 balls. Here they are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And let's say we've got n equals 4. So we've got 4 bins to put them in. So bin 1, bin 2, bin 3, and bin 4. And since they're distinguishable, it means we can imagine they're all labeled, or they all have numbers. And we're interested in the ways of distributing these balls into these bins. In particular, we want to know, you know, if we do a random distribution, what's the probability that one of these bins, bin i, has exactly k balls in it. So uh, an example of a distribution would be uh, ball 1 could end up in bin 3, ball 2 could also end up in bin 3. So there was a, a sample, and so maybe I'll just put the numbers of what was in here. So we had 4 was in there, and then we had 3 and 5 landed in here, and 1 and 2 landed in here. It just turned out that there was a bin that was empty, and one bin had one, two bins each had two balls in them. So that's the idea of distributing the balls into the bins, and we want to know some answers to some problems about this. So the first one is, what is the probability that bin i has k balls? So we're imagining bin i, this is fixed. So this is some bin we've just fixed. Could be bin 3, for example. What's the probability that bin 3 has k balls? So that's how we're going to start this off. We're going to fix i somewhere between 1 and n. Now we're interested in the number of balls that bin i has. So we could for example, let y i be the number of balls in bin i. And so what are we interested in? Well, we want to know what is the probability that y i is equal to k. So let's get a feel for what these probabilities are. What's the probability that y i is equal to 0? What's the probability that when you distribute these balls into the bins that this particular bin i gets 0 balls? Well, what this means is that the m balls ended up being distributed over n minus 1 containers. So I look back at this diagram and I think, is there a way to extract from this diagram a way to represent it as an object that I know how to count. And the idea is absolutely I can. I can think of it as, you know, one, two, three, four, five as the balls. And then underneath it I just write the bin they went to. So this would have been three, three, and then ball three went to bin 2, ball 4 went to bin 1, and 5 went to bin 2. So I can encode it as this string 33212. That tells me exactly where balls 1 through 5 went. And I can use that to help me figure out what the probability of yi being 0 is. What's the probability that the ith bin has no balls in it? Well, it means the m balls had to get distributed amongst the 
n minus 1 bins. So that means for ball 1, there are n minus 1 choices for it. For ball 2, there are n minus 1 choices for it. All the way up to ball m, there are n minus 1 choices for it because I'm avoiding putting it in bin i. And that's going to be divided by the total number of arrangements I get, and that is there are n choices for every ball, so that would be n to the m. So this is, maybe I'll put it in a different color, this is ways to distribute balls and leave bin i empty. And this is the size of sample space. The unrestricted ways to distribute the balls across the n bins. So there we go. We've got our value and we could simplify it a little bit perhaps. Maybe I could write it as a 1 minus 1 over n to the m. Now how about the next one? The probability that y i is equal to 1. Ultimately we're interested in what is the probability that bin i has k ball, so we want to know what is the probability that y i is k. We're going to work our way up there. So this says that the bin i has to have one ball in it. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Well, how many different arrangements are there that has bin i with one ball? Well, what I could do is I could think of how many ways could I distribute the balls so that bin i has one in it. Well, first I could pick the ball that I want to go in it. So there are m choices for the ball that I want to go in bin i. And then the remaining m minus 1 balls can get put in any of the n minus 1 containers. So there are n minus 1 choices for the next ball, and the next one, and the next one. So I got n minus 1 to the m minus 1. And that's all over the number of ways to, or the size of the sample space, I guess I more succinctly put it. I was going to say the number of ways to spread out the balls without any conditions. Um, but that's just the size of the sample space. So there we go. We can think of it, you know, a little bit more generally as I chose a ball to put in bin i, and then I've got this 1 over n. I'm just rewriting this in a slightly different way. And then the m minus 1 I could write as the 1 minus 1 over n to the m minus 1. So I could rewrite that expression in this way, and the way this is really telling me that to think about the probability is that what's the probability that bin i has one ball? It's the number of ways it could have one ball, that is of any of the m balls, you can pick one of them to put in there. The probability that that particular ball that you've chosen that you want to get into bin i, the probability that it actually gets into bin i is the 1 over n, and then the 1 minus 1 over n to the m minus 1 is the probability that all the remaining balls miss bin i. So that's another way to think about it. And so what this tells me then is that in general, what's the probability that bin i will contain k balls? Well, I'll think about it in terms of the number of outcomes that has bin i containing k balls, and that is the number of ways it could have k balls is choose the k balls to go into bin i. Once you've chosen those balls, then the remaining balls, which are m minus k of them, they can go into any of the remaining n minus 1 bins. So you've got n minus 1 choices for the next ball, n minus 1 for the next one, and so on, all the way down for those balls that aren't going to end up in bin i. And all that's over n to the m. Or again, we could rewrite it as m choose k, 1 over n to the uh, k 
k 1 minus 1 over n to the m minus k. So that's another way we could write that expression. And when we write it in this way, what do we see? We see that yi is binomially distributed So the probability distribution for this random variable yi actually turns out to be a binomial distribution, as we can see there. All right, so we've worked out the probability that bin i has exactly k balls. And that's it right there. Or you can think about it in this way as well. Either of these are equivalent to think about. Okay, what is the next question? The next question is asking us, on average, how many bins are empty? So we distribute the balls. We get a number of empty bins, perhaps. So on average, how many empty bins do we expect to get? Let's just draw out an example to see what we're dealing with here. So let's just say we've got five bins in this case and we've distributed some balls amongst those bins. So I got a ball here, maybe I have three of them there, and then I've got another one over here. The balls would be numbered, the bins are numbered, and I'm interested in how many bins are empty. So that means I'm really interested in a random variable that takes some distribution of balls into bins and returns the number of empty bins. So in this case, it would return 2. So that's the random variable I'm interested in. So let x be the number of empty bins. Now in order to deal with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a few more random variables. So let xi, where i goes from 1 to n, and what it's going to do, it's going to be kind of like the random variable we introduced above, yi, where yi returned the number of balls in a bin. In this case, I don't really care about the number of balls in the bin. I'm just interested in empty, not empty. So in this case, xi is going to be the random variable which just indicates whether the bin is empty or not. So let xi be the random variable given as follows. So xi of our element in our sample space, so some arrangement of balls to bins, returns 1 if bin i is empty, and 0 if bin i is not empty. So notice here, 1 indicates empty, 0 not empty, because we're interested in empty bins, so that's my valuable piece of information. What are the empty ones? That's why I've assigned a 1 as an indicator there. 1 if it's empty. And so then, what I notice is that, well, maybe we'll, we can do a brief example of this. We'll take our 5-bin example from above, and we'll throw the balls in there, something like this. Then I could ask, you know, what is x2 of this? Well, x2 is asking for the indicator of is the bin empty or not? So you can think of it as a Boolean, empty or not. So I scan across and say that's a 2, so it's really asking about bin 2. Bin 2, not empty, therefore the value comes back as 0 as opposed to, maybe if I ask about bin 1, 
In this case, we'll redraw our arrangement to balls. We had one in bin two, three in bin three, and one in bin five. In this case, bin one is empty. So this would return the value of one because bin one is empty. And now if you think about this, you know, it's going to return a value of zero if the bin is not empty and a one if it is empty. So what we get is that the random variable we are really interested in is just the sum of these random variables all the way up to xn because all these random variables are going to do is just return either a 1, yes it's empty for that bin, or no it's not empty so it'll return a 0. So if I add them all up it's just going to count the number of empty bins. And so I've managed to write down x as a sum of simpler random variables. And so that means I can go ahead and say what is the expected value for x well, by linearity, it's the expected value of x1 plus the expected value of x2 plus dot 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 all the way up to the expected value of xn. And that's by linearity. So the fact that e is a linear function. Now, what else can I get? Well, I get that since e of xi for any of the i's, i only has two values in its range, either 0 or 1. The expected value of xi is 0 times the probability that xi is 0 plus 1 times the probability that xi is 1. But remember what these mean. xi is 0 means the bin i is not empty, whereas xi is 1 means bin i is empty. So what is the probability that xi is 1? That's the probability that bin i is empty. We've already worked that out. We've worked out that value above. That's this, the probability that bin i has no balls in it. And so that's 1 minus 1 over n to the m. So we worked out that value already. So this is 1 minus 1 over n to the m. And therefore, we have that the expected value of x is it's the sum of these n values but all of them are the same they are all 1 minus 1 over n to the m so this is n times 1 minus 1 over n to the m and so there we go that is the expected number of empty bins. Now, of course, this depends on n and m. So we'd like to get a feel for what this value is. You know, how big is this? How small is this? What proportion of the bins would be empty? So I'd really like to know, you know, of the n bins, what proportion of them are empty. So this is really telling me it's 1 minus 1 over n to the m. So I kind of want to get a feel for how big this number is. That's where we can use some approximation ideas. So if I just rewrite this in the following way, I'm going to write it as n times 1 minus 1 over n to the n, and then I will put that to the power of m over n. So all I did was insert this extra power of an n, and the reason I've done that is because now if I draw your attention to this quantity here, what we have is that 
this is approximately 1 over e for n large. So the limiting value as n goes to infinity of 1 minus 1 over n to the n, that is 1 over e. So this is a result you would have seen in calculus. You may not remember it, but it was certainly there in calculus. We talked about writing e as a limit. One, In fact, we wrote e as 1 plus 1 over n to the n, and then we could see that 1 minus 1 over n to the n actually gives us uh, a limiting value of 1 over e. But the idea is that for n large, and it doesn't have to be too large, um, but for n large, you know, as soon as you get it, like n being uh, 6 or 7, you're getting pretty close to, to e that this is approximately e, which means that this whole thing is approximately n times e to the negative m over n. So there is a good approximation to the number of empty bins. So what that means is that in the particular case, you know, if m is equal to n, you have equal number of bin to balls, then e to the x is approximately n e to the negative 1, and that's about 0 0.368, that's about, that's what 1 over e is roughly equal to, times n. So it means roughly 37% are empty. You know, if I had the same number of bins and balls, on average I would expect to be there to be about 37% of them that are empty when I do a random distribution. So that's what we get here. So again, let me just reiterate that we got the exact value for the expected number of empty bins. Then we used the fact that we could approximate that value when n is large enough using uh, e. And then in the case when m was equal to n, we use that approximate value to sort of get down to a number that we can sort of get some feeling about. You know, how many bins are roughly empty? That exact value, n times 1 minus 1 over n to the m, that's not really telling me how much until I start inserting values for n and m in there. But at least in this case, when I say, well, when m is equal to n, and I use the approximate value for um, 1 minus 1 over n to the n in terms of 1 over e, this is telling me that it's roughly around the order of 37% that are empty. Okay, so I've left uh, an exercise there for you to work on, to ponder. On average, how many bins have one ball? So we've just answered the question, how many bins have zero balls, or are empty? you could answer the next question, on average, how many bins would have one ball? All right, so that's it for the bins and balls problem. Uh, we'll look at the coupon collector's problem next.